followed by a talk back with the audience so they can ask and interact and stuff like that. So it's good to see us get a chance to ask them what the hell they thought about this or that. So, but Hey, on to SEO. Now that we're, uh, our information is being sent to a third party as if two parties weren't enough. <laughs> yep. I well, gotcha. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of SEO Fight Club. I'm just saying hello in chat and reminding people to ask questions. Um, now that I have a, uh, a stream deck, I ought to make a button to do that part. Um, all right. So... Uh, we were planning on starting a two-part uh, episode about the SEM Rush uh, report on ranking factors, uh, but we're missing one of our co-hosts today. So Charles had a, uh, a business meeting he couldn't uh, say no to, so uh, we'll try and start the two-part uh, series next time um my uh my initial feelings on this report is it kind of confirms a lot of things we already knew which i like um it it didn't have any huge gotchas for me but i want to go back and take a closer look because sometimes they're are big things hidden in the little details. And, and so, you know, I think uh, a study like this, it, it takes some time to, to really wrap your mind around my initial response to it was, uh, uh, I, I wanted to go on a huge rant <laughs> and there, there are some pet peeves I have in it, uh, with how the data is handled. Um, and some of those pet peeves might not be real. So I need to go back and reevaluate before I say something that is possibly untrue. Um, but uh, there, there definitely is one minor gripe that I will rant heavily on. <laughs> but it is really a nitpick. Like, I guarantee, like, nobody is going to care about it except for me and, you know, maybe Lee to a lesser extent. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you know, data data handling is is kind of the thing and uh so yeah it's going to be a two-part series and part one we're going to talk about our gripes of how the study was performed and analyze uh, you know what we think they were thinking when they did it the way they did it so we're going to talk about the methodology and their limitations and uh and those types of things and little issues we see in the presentation of the information and how we understand it, how we interpret it. And then in part two, we'll actually look at the factors and talk about the SEO stuff. Um, and so I kind of think that's a good thing to do because I don't think a lot of people look at the methodology part. It's like an appendice at the end and that's the part they don't care about and it kind of can matter the most if you're not careful mm -hmm. um and so you know figure we'd walk through all that together and maybe we can uh answer a question or two on the statistics of it you know show you what these correlation coefficients mean and what you can uh, use them for in terms of understanding what you're seeing in studies like these and and so i think there's a, a possibility that you know it can be uh, educational for a lot of people so what do you think about that for next week lee well, i'm excited about it i mean i've not looked at the data yet because i knew that um you know charles uh couldn't be here today so but lately, I have been looking at a number of different studies, not just SEO studies and other things that I find myself, uh, you know, jumping out of my chair and, you know, throwing things and going, what were they thinking about when they, you know, how could they put out this kind of crap? It's the missing this is, you know, it's these sort of things that when you get, um, when somebody comes out with a study, I, I always applaud people who will come out 
and do a test or a study or an analysis of some sort. And if they will, you know, honestly acknowledge, uh, you know, the potential flaws and things like that in the study, in the data gathering, in the analysis mechanisms, love it. If they, you know, if they will show it for what it is, but too often I find studies that don't do that, or they purport to do much more than what the data or the analytic technique would allow them to do. So uh, because I've been in a uh, throw things at the wall mood, I said, you know what, let me cool off from these other studies that I've read for a little bit, and I'll wait and read this one uh, before our show next week. Yeah, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll take the, the uh, oops, one second, please. That was Semrush at the door saying, hey. <laughs> so, but it ought to be interesting uh, for us to go through that particular uh, set of factors. We'll talk about what we agree with, what we don't agree with, uh, the methodologies, you know, what it can mean, what it doesn't mean, all those sort of things. It should be a fun two-part uh, show. So I'm looking forward to it. Sorry about that. Uh, dog escaped the yard. Had to go deal with it. Uh, we're having terrible rain out here, so the wind can actually break the gate open. Um, yeah, so this uh, this series, uh, I, I think it'll be really cool. So I'm excited for it. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the news headlines. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, the, uh, eternal update is still happening. Um, Japanese keyword hack. We've known about WordPress getting hacked for a while now. I assume that's not new to anybody. So that's been happening forever. Um, the one I thought was interesting well, a couple were interesting. Um, one is uh, Search Console getting rid of the crawl rate setting. Um, you know, they've had this setting there for a long, long time. And I'm trying to imagine a case where people would actually want to dial it down. Like when people actually needed to dial it down was was when web hosting was super expensive and the amount of bandwidth you could get was very, very limited. So earlier days of the internet and it would cost money if you created a million page website back then when, you know, hosting and, and internet connection uh, bandwidth, you know, had real costs. If you created a million pages i mean that could cost you thousands of dollars just on the bot traffic and so at that time you know yeah you had to have control because there were damages and you know as moore's law happened you know it got cheaper cheaper and now the damages are are pretty slight if you were to claim damages on it um and all the black hats you know they're putting millions of pages out there. And so I, I doubt that Google would, you know, I doubt that Google would want to let people decide at this point how fast or slow to crawl a website. And we know that uh, Google has safety measures built in. Uh, they will aggressively stop crawling your website if your response times get too slow. And, uh, or if your application starts throwing uh, 500 errors. And so there's actually a whole category of negative SEO attacks that are built on these safety mechanisms. Um, and so it's, you know, it's just an interesting thing, an interesting evolution there that I don't think a lot of SEOs think about or, or uh, uh, realize that, you know, the retiring of these tools is kind of the changing of an age. What do you think about this one, Lee? You know, my my first reaction uh, when I saw this headline um, 
was a little more jaded. Everything that you said is, I think, is correct. You know, there's there's no reason the reasons that it originally was built for, you know, no longer apply largely. And if the safety mechanisms that they have, you know, actually operate the way they say they operate, there, there's no danger from them, you know, coming and doing a denial of service, crawling your uh, your site. I looked at it more along the lines of um, the way that Google handled, uh, you know, no follow, do follow historically. You know, first they said, all right, you know, you can you can do these things to delineate these two, you know, categories of uh, of links, and then it was, you know, well. You know, we might at certain times ignore the the no follow directive, and then it's like, yeah, we really don't pay attention to that anymore because the you know SEOs were trying to uh, to gather all the link juice for themselves, and you know everything uh, was no follow going away from a site, and you know that makes the uh, the internet hard to crawl and everything else. So Google just said, you know, to heck with you guys, we're gonna we're gonna crawl it um, regardless. So I kind of thought, you know. Why would they let you set the crawl rate? Because they're going to crawl the way they want to crawl. You know, there's no reason for them not to, because they need your your data. They're they're bigger, they're badder, they're all of those things. So I was a little more cynical about uh, the reasons, but probably it's it's just because there's no reason for them to have it anymore. You know, there's there's literally, you know, safeguards are there. Um, probably the usage rate is low. <laughs> well. Um, I, I think another driving force for them is uh, support regret. So they create a capability. Look, we're letting you do X. And then later on, they're like, oh, we need to support your ability to do X. Let's mm -hmm. shut it down. Um, and so this is, you know, this probably became more trouble than it's worth to maintain on their end. And uh, we know how fond they are of, not supporting things um so this would be you know another thing that they wouldn't have to support going forward uh, i kind of think it's similar in that regard to the url parameter tool they're mm -hmm. definitely technically capable of letting you do this uh they just don't want to support it so it's better for them if it goes away well, I also think the um, uh, thing that was interesting, I don't know if this is one of the ones he had, but I think it was uh, Honey had been on the show talking about AI detection and, uh, you know, how it was going to shake things up at, at Google. And it was later that day we looked and there was a headline that Google had laid off a bunch of employees due to AI. And I'm like, what do you mean due to AI? You know, uh, and the thing was the employees were being laid off out of their ad centers because they've now developed AI capabilities that are able to field the the questions and the flow and you know a lot of the things that human beings used to do so they're just being replaced and I think they were laying yeah. off like 30,000 employees yeah imagine imagine if you will using a large language model to say itemize the rule and fractions of this ad and then you paste in the ad text and it uses its training set to say this ad violated rules 1 7 and 13. Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you don't need a human being to look at those <laughs> Uh, right. You can throw servers at it and qualify or disqualify ads in real time. And getting qualified ads live means more money in real time for Google. So if Google can provide a, a faster, better service that makes them better money by laying people off, which typically increases stock price. Right. I, you know... <laughs> Now, personally, I, I think it's kind of repugnant to do that, but I'm not a publicly traded company with fiduciary duty to shareholders where Google is, and they have to put those shareholders uh, consideration first and foremost. So they're doing what they're obligated to do, even though I don't like it. We've also talked about, you know, Google's struggles with uh, scale and their growth um, you know, it's limited because there's not more users coming on the web, you know, all the major countries and most of the minor countries of the world have pretty much, you know, everybody has access, um, you know, and they're driven by ad revenue, which, you know, if 
you've got a certain market share. It's a dominant market share. They're not really eating into, you know, uh, Bing and the others you know, anymore. They've been pretty stable for a number of years now. What's the growth model or, you know, for, for Google? They're, they're doubling down on AI and part of, uh, you know, growing their bottom line means that they're going to have to cut costs in a variety of places. So seeing staff layoffs, seeing, you know, services being uh, retired, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to talk about the business site uh, things that, you know, happened over the last couple of days where they said, hey, we're going to take that out of uh, service. You know, it looks like they're they're streamlining a lot of things that aren't valuable to them. They're making go away. Um, so this looks like another one of those things as well. Yeah. If you're in a big data center approving some sort of application of something, I mean, that writings on the wall for those kinds of jobs, you might want to start strategizing now about how to pivot into something a bit, uh, more stable in the long term. Um, yeah, I mean, change, change is scary in that regard. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's look at a couple more of these. Uh, all right. So the Google business profile websites are going away. Now, my, my feelings on this probably don't reflect the reality because there's probably a legitimate use case reality out there that somebody is uh, dependent on. But from my own personal experience, which is a sample size of one, um, this feature, to my knowledge, was largely used by Black Hats doing Black Hat things. Do you have a, a different understanding of this? Uh, I think the intent when it first came out was, you know, uh, Lee's Plumbing could come on, I could get a, you know, a GMB, you know, and, and a website without needing, you know, a designer, this, that, or the other. And it was fairly easy and it integrated nicely. And, you know, it was basically point click and you're done uh, type of thing. So, you know, the, the intent was, Hey, we can help small business owners, but then SEOs come along and they say, Hey, you know, we love to use Google against Google. There seem to be some advantages here. There's some things that we can do with these sort of sites and then it looked like it was uh, several months back that they'd kind of restricted access to it. They'd made the, you know, the, the buttons go away and everything else. But from that point forward, it's just been SEOs going, oh, here's the back door, how you can still get these. Um, so, you know, that uh, it, the writing's been on the wall for a little while. Um, but Terry was responding. Terry, if you want to jump on on this, he was responding this morning. He's skeptical about this March yeah, thing. Come on. How many times have we seen Google say, oh, this is going to go away um, on March 1? And come November, they're like, okay, December, it's going to be gone. Um, that has happened. I, I can see why they want to get rid of it. But there are those, you know, mom and pop um, immigrant nail salons where they're only getting 20 or 25 bucks a pop from new customers they're not going to fork out 800 dollars for a new website but this allowed them to have a website a place on the web to support their google business profile mm -hmm. and that's who they're hurting not the uh not lee's plumbing that you know charges <laughs> 250 dollars an hour um or something like that right but uh, but it would not surprise me. I'm skeptical that it'll be gone, you know, in six weeks, whatever they're calling first of March, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of feel that the vast majority of small businesses in those categories have a son or a nephew or a cousin or an uncle that can set up a website for them if they are that uh, limited. Um, you know, and there are cost effective website options out there. So I, I don't think the viable small businesses in those categories are really in jeopardy with this going away. I don't think that's true, even though it might've been convenient for them. 
Yeah, uh, it's right. convenient, and they don't know about all the other options out there that are free or nearly free and stuff like that. Um, they're, now their nephew may, or their niece might, but um, but I just know often when Google tells us that on such and such a date, they don't necessarily adhere to that date. Yeah. So yeah, I thought that was a, a one worth mentioning. All right. So with that, um, you know, we'll mention Magic PR. I don't think we have uh, Madg today, but uh, we're still in the process of setting up test sites. I'm setting up close to 50 that I'll be running press releases on each site and to see how they do and and what's working for me. And that's the largest test I've ever even heard of in press releases. Um, so, you know, that's something at least. And uh, there might be a larger test out there. And if there is, reply in the YouTube comments and let us know where to, to read about it. Because um, I definitely would like to see other research on the topic as well. Uh, Lee, how many sites are you going to be testing with, do you think? You know, the I'm I'm going uh, smaller, but I'm going. Uh, I know the, the the use case that that you have uh, for it. Uh, so I'm thinking about um, setting up, you know, pairs of of sites. I'll call it TED style one page sites. You know, both going after wool socks or you know whatever else, and using you know different sort of link building press releases on one and something on another. Maybe one press release service and another. Because you can just set these up, you know, fairly quickly and easily and just see, you know, what kind of uh, bumps you get from fairly equivalent uh, setups. Although I am going to use it for some other uh, pieces or well that are less well structured for a, a traditional A-B sort of tests as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to go for uh, just very basic uh, success rate. Uh, stats. So I want to know uh, of my cluster how many went up and what is up defined as. Was up largely about three positions? Was up largely about 20 positions? What What is up? Right. <laughs> or what is down? And, and so, because I think one of the biggest things out there is how viable our press releases what's kind of the the success rate and what's your methodology for getting that success rate and so that's what i'm trying to hope to to share and and document well and kind of use that as a soundboard for any future testing i do yeah and then uh yeah, and then I'd like to get into things of, you know, let's try to get itemized into best practices. Does doing X beat what we saw in the baseline standard? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. do we get better success rates than what we did on the 50 if we do, you know, this tactic? And so trying trying to set up what is control, <laughs> and then we can start to figure out what is game breaking. Exactly. All right, so uh, let's look at some questions, and then we'll probably keep it a shorter show this time. Not a lot of questions in the list, uh, so make sure if you have a question you want answered that you ask it early, because if you wait till the last couple minutes of the show, it's hard to work those in. Um, all right, so let's see what we have here. Um, how exactly does an indexer work all right so this is largely proprietary knowledge so a lot of the indexing companies they don't want you to know how it works um and they're uh with good reason because if google knew what they were doing google might be inclined to uh fix the glitch <laughs> Uh, so Google likes everything to go through their process pipeline. And when people find other pipelines that get you expedited treatment, they're, they're not particularly fond of those initiatives. Um, why are they successful at getting my pages crawled? And are there any risks with using indexers? So, uh, 
your question of how exactly does it work, I could only answer that if I had their source code. I can only vaguely and generally tell you how they kind of work. Uh, there's a class of indexer that is based on having an already uh, uh, ranking page that is highly visited by Google Bot. So let's say it's the front page of CNN.com where stories are popping every day and it's changing once an hour and Googlebot is coming to get those latest stories. If you throw in a link onto that homepage where Google's coming back every five, 10 minutes to get the updates, that's a very rapid way to get crawl. And so I'd say a lot of the indexers are built on that frequency of visit type of methodology. Uh, there are other indexers that are simply about getting uh, backlinks in places that Google is not opposed to recrawling, probably at slower intervals, though. Uh, think along the lines of like YouTube uh, links and descriptions. So you could build an indexer putting links into descriptions of YouTube videos and just rotating them out after a few days for other links. And they, they would get reprocessed and recrawled. And so there's kind of the backlink indexing as well. Um, there's a, a few other methods that are proprietary that I'm not allowed to talk about, but they kind of involve older subsystems of uh of google search and things of that nature uh that are still kind of out there but not quite gone yet um so there are those style of indexers too uh terry you're kind of an expert on indexers am i leaving out a broad category oh terry I got it looks like he's, I think he's frozen. Oh, yeah, you, okay. killed, you killed Terry, Ted. You asked him the question. He just just right there, just froze. All right, we'll come back to so Terry I think, later. I, I think that you know the the general idea is that indexers put the link somewhere that Google crawls. You know that's that's ultimately what it is. And you know some of the things, most of them deal with you know backlinks of varying sorts. Whether you know some of them had the the old school where you would have the uh, um, web statistics sites or you know things like that. You could just go and you know Google and uh, Yahoo and things like that crawl those periodically. The only thing is if you use indexers or a lot of indexers or use indexers a lot, you know you you're building um, junk links. You know, and, and to the degree that you believe that junk links can be problematic or harmful, then yes, it, it could potentially hurt you using, you know, uh, a bazillion different methods of doing it. But in general, I've not heard of anybody getting any sort of harm or penalty or grief or struggle by using indexation services or multiple indexation services. Yeah, and oftentimes these indexing services, if they're built properly, the uh, backlinks are temporary. So if Google's visiting every 10 minutes, they'll leave your link up for a day. If Google is visiting every day, they'll leave your link up for a week. And then hopefully those links go away once Google is aware of your website. Uh, so they would typically be fairly minimal in risk in that regard if they're built properly uh, but i can't attest to which ones are built properly or not because none of them share their source code so you got to kind of ask around and find out who's been burned by what and which ones kind of work best and uh uh, Clint Butler, uh, when he was co-hosting here, he had a great piece of advice in that if you want, if you really need to get indexed, uh, the best thing you can do is use multiple methods. So people have all these different techniques for getting indexed. They all kind of work and don't work at different points in time. So if you really need to get indexed, use a variety of methodologies, and that usually gets you your best outcome. Uh, Terry, can you hear me now? 
Yeah, our, our power keeps dropping in and out. Heavy winds, a lot of rain. Um, but yeah, I think you've uh, talked about everything as far as indexing that you ought to talk about as far as indexing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the real question. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I I use indexers. My software, uh, the next version has built in multi indexing, so you can enter a URL and send it out to a handful of indexers simultaneously. And and so yeah, there's there's a lot of those concepts. I think it's generally fine. You don't want to spam it. Uh, is the thing. You, it's something you do at the end of the day before you go home for the day. So if you're and doing often, it once a day, sure. Yeah, often just getting it crawled is enough. Mm -hmm. so there's, uh, you know, services out there that'll get your stuff crawled. No guarantee of indexing, but, you know, that does much the same job. Right. Have you seen the correlation between high quality score and rankings? Uh, well, it, it makes sense because if you look at what goes into quality score, it's having your keyword in the title, having your keyword in the headings, having your keyword in the sentences. And, you know, quality score is an SEO score effectively for the landing page related right. to the ad text. So if there's agreement between the ad text and the landing page it's pointing to, you get more quality score. And so yes, properly SEOing your website ought to give you on average better quality score across all your pages if your ads are targeting what the pages are actually about. So you need that agreement piece in there too. And, uh, quality score it impacts not only your cost per click but how well you rank so there's two dimensions of impact from quality score on your ads and uh, it's for this reason i like to say that seo lifts all boats so uh, whenever you do good seo you'll find that all your other channel marketing gets improved and pay-per-click is definitely improved by seo uh, and similarly, you know, if you run a TV ad or billboards, you know, what do those result in? Well, they result typically in brand search or product search. And then product search needs SEO in order to get the good ranking in the click. And so good SEO, it, it impacts all channel marketing. What do you think, Lee? I agree. You know, uh, that's one of the things that uh, some people have, have talked about, you know, is is one of the ways of, you know, checking your SEO is to check the quality score, uh, you know, from a pay-per-click campaign. If you, if it's bad, you know, then you, you've got issues that need to be uh, fixed and it's, and it's not just pay-per-click issues. Well, they're, they're fundamental SEO issues. But just keep in mind, the website could be properly SEOed and the ad text could be smoke and crack. <laughs> so if, well, yeah, if I mean, you, you could have a pay page optimized for, you know, SEO Seattle, and you're trying to do an ad for cat toys, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, because keep in mind that the target of the quality score is the ad. Mm -hmm. So it's not targeting the page. It's not saying the quality of the page is low. It's saying that the quality of this ad for that page is not good. Right. But if I have a page that I'm, I'm I've optimized for SEO Seattle, and I have an ad that's targeting SEO Seattle, and my quality score is low, that's an yeah. SEO problem. That's not but, a paper problem. But if you're if you have a web page that's a casino and you have an ad for how to train your puppies, yeah. It's not saying that the casino page is poorly tuned. It's saying that your ad for that page is low quality. Yes, yeah, mismatched. So yeah, keep in mind that you you have to be mindful of what's in that ad because that'll that'll grossly affect quality score too, despite how it's tuned on the website. Um, how do I optimize to show up as output in ChatGPT and Bard? They're using Common Crawl, so if you have all bots blocked in your Cloudflare implementation, you have successfully shot yourself in the foot. So you need to stop 
uh, blocking all bots because everybody training large language models, they're either using common crawl or they're using some crawler you don't know. And so if you indiscriminately block bots, you're not in the AI. So you need to go back through and be more lenient about your bots. So that's the main thing that you need to do today if you want to be in those models in the future. Um, so hold on a second. Let me push you a little bit on this one because I, I know your your opinion on this. You know, is that you should allow uh, Common Crawl to come and you know have access to your site, or your pages for a variety of of reasons. Can you think of cases where you wouldn't want them to come and crawl, where you would want to block? Well, in in those cases, I think what you actually want is more discriminant web development. So uh, the whole web for the past 15, 20 years has been on a, uh, a trust everyone type of architecture. Show everything you have and trust everyone. And then in specific cases, when the user agent is X, when the IP address is Y, then we deny. So trust everyone, specific cases, denial. And this kind of gets into the concepts of stealth SEO, which is different from black hat cloaking. There are fundamental differences. Uh, but in stealth SEO, you trust no one. And you're saying certain information is need to know only. Oh, you're Google. I will disclose this information to you. Oh, you're Bing. I will disclose this information to you. And so that's a trust no one and make specific exceptions on trust. So it's kind of the inverted model. And so in those cases, you know, I, I like the stealth model better because you can be open for the future. You can be open for all these different bots you may not recognize that are large language models. You can... Uh, you're trusting no one, so you're not tipping your hand to all the SEO bots that are building massive databases of information to your competitors and selling it to the highest bidder. You know, you, you kind of need to change your thinking. And uh, and I know that's that's really academic and hard to wrap your mind around, but it's it's technically doable and it's not very hard so if you explore these concepts they lead you down the path of stealth seo so guys i was uh <clears throat> lately i've heard a lot of large organizations discuss how they want to block chat gpt because they're worried about copyright and they don't like the idea of somebody crawling them and i've i've always had to re-explain to folks first of all google's already taking everything off the website and putting it putting it on their search results. So if you're worried about copyright, well, that's already happening with the Google. And, and number two, I've, I've explained to people how many different bots, and I've shown them in our logs, how many different bots are really crawling our website. And some of them are doing, just like you said, Ted, they're the less nefarious SEM rushes and Ahrefs that are taking our data, but then selling it, which is interesting in and of itself. But then there's lots of other bots. I mean, there are so many weird bots hitting all of our sites. Some I've tried to figure out what are people doing? Why are they doing this? Others are pretty clearly it's someone up to no good, and so we'll block them. Um, but yeah, I, I found it interesting. A lot of people just, they want to draw the line at ChatGPT now for some reason, mainly because it's the one they're aware of. And they didn't realize that for the past 20 years, they've been getting crawled every day by all kinds of bots. I, I think the, the best argument in that area is with the uh, image AI, so the mid-journey and stuff, where artists uh, go to great lengths to create amazing artwork, and then they see subtle variations of their hard work being peddled for 20 bucks a month. <laughs> Um, so I, I think the the artists who got trained on have a, a better gripe than, you know, the text information, but it's kind of the same thing. So when you when you find something that, you know, if you made an amazing, you know, piece of content and you find that one of the AI answers in a question about that topic largely smacks of what you wrote. And that doesn't feel good. You know, I think there is some amount of legitimate gripe in there. Um, 
but yeah i mean the laws the laws aren't there copyright law was you know established to handle you know black and white moving pictures and you know that type of thing and that type of era and it hasn't really evolved with the times and now we're in a case where the laws on the books don't reflect the reality of how the world works and so yeah that's a hard one to solve i think there are there are things that people don't like is the the speed of it like there was a uh, a case uh, that comedian sarah silverman brought against chat gpt because people could go and say write jokes in the style of Sarah Silverman and it, it would do a good job and there were there were people out there that were you know pushing these things out there because she's a you know popular comedian and you can do that with a lot of different things but now it's so easy i mean people did that historically they would emulate you know people who were at the top of their game but you had to put in some work to do it now you just have to punch a few keystrokes and you know you've got uh, things there so it's the same thing. I like author X. Let me write a book in the style of author X. And now all of a sudden, you know, things start to look very, very similar. The mimicry has gotten very, very easy to do. And it's blurred some of those lines between, you know, sort of art and the expression and the, the, the way it's written, the way it's done, the style of the joke, the style of, you know, the picture. And I think that's what drives people nuts is that I can go and create this wonderful thing. And then within, you know, the time things get crawled and processed, everybody else can, you know, do a mimic of me, you know, like that. I think that's what's the unnerving piece. And people don't like the speed that technology has enabled us to sort of, I don't say clone, but. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the truth is. You you can write the 10 best jokes on paper. The magic's in the delivery. Mm -hmm. So you can give that list of jokes to me and they'll all fall flat. And you can give those jokes to a comedian and the room will be screaming. Right. You know? So uh, as, as much as people want to make it a, a, about the writing, you know, there's more to the art than just that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Ted, what do you think of the art schools where people are asked as part of their homework to do a painting in the style of Ruben, in the style of, you know, uh, some well-known artist? The, those, it's manual mid-journey. But whoever controls <laughs> those works isn't suing yeah, people yeah. for there are... using them as training or for... All those books you read or I read or Lee read growing up that taught us things that we now come into when we go to make a decision on something, we draw on all that training we had, that huge corpus of data, and nobody sues us for using something we learned in, in this class or we read from that book. Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, my big gripe about School of Rock is they... Uh, don't have the songwriting uh, program for the kids. It's all cover art. And so uh, all these kids, they, they are basically doing, you know, very advanced karaoke, but they, they miss the whole point of creating original art. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, I love school of rock. It's magical, but I, I wish they had the original art program because that is the whole reason to do art is to make original art. Yeah, but and, I think you have to, you know, like like Terry was saying, you know, you go to art school and you you take painting, you're going to, you know, basically copy the Mona Lisa so that you can learn the style of, you know, the the great masters and stuff like that. And by learning the style and the color choices and the, the way they, you know, the strokes and all these sort of things, then you can do it. And I can see, you know, learning rock by learning Led Zeppelin songs, you know, or something along those lines, because you learn a little bit about how it's done, how it comes together and stuff like that. And then it, it informs your choices when you decide to, you know, create your own original work. Uh, it's not necessarily that it will always sound like Led Zeppelin or look like the Mona Lisa, but um, it won't look like garbage. You're, you're starting by, you know, modeling the best. 
yeah it you know it makes you a better artist but it kind of boxes in your creativity in many respects i i often find that you know some of my favorite artists i mean they started just out of the blue and weren't really classically trained on copying somebody else's style um and uh you know i i hate to you know i'd hate to to see people get you know so down the path of being cover artists you know whether it's in painting or illustration or music uh that they they miss the joy of the creativity of making something awesome of their own to put out in the world i think that's a, a much better reward from those endeavors and i i just hate to see that you know be lost and it and i think it largely is you know i think people aren't creating things they can be proud of are you really proud of the mid-journey image i mean sure you get some chuckles from time to time out of them but that yeah <laughs> and uh you know, s similarly, if, if all you do is cover other artists, I mean, there are some amazing uh, uh, musicians on YouTube that are cover artists like uh, uh, Leo uh, Macchioli. I, I forget how to pronounce his last name. He does the heavy metal covers of uh, popular songs. And and there's an art in doing that. And that's that's kind of cool. So that's kind of on the edge of taking somebody else's work and making it your own. Um, but I don't know. I, I I I fear the loss of the creative side. I think that's where a lot of things get hit. When you can prompt for something instead of being creative, do you lose some ability to be creative? I think there's there's an art. You know, I look at. Um... Honey and I have a number of different uh, discussions about like top 40 radio. There's a formula, you know, there. And sometimes you're not after, I'm not after being creative. I just want to be a rock star. So write me a song, the lyrics in the style of Led Zeppelin. Give me a score like that. Let me go out and perform it. And if it's, that's what the, the, the audience wants, then I'm going to be on the stage and people are going to be screaming my name and all that sort of stuff, which is all I really want. It's not the creativity. I just want the opportunity to make the money and have the, you know, the, the hordes of screaming fans, okay. uh, follow me everywhere. And, you know, based on number one, uh, chart toppers on billboard, write me a number one chart topping song <laughs> right can you say the monkeys <laughs> so now, now i need to go run a uh prompt on chat gpt <laughs> um, see what yeah. yeah yeah all right um let's see how does it affect ranking if you have uh unusual ANSI and uh other characters in the url um so there there are ANSI character URLs there are UTF URLs um uh you know they it's usually it's usually a case of not how the browser handles it it's how the server handles it so if you're not using a web server that's capable of handling different encodings in the URLs, it may behave in unexpected ways. If it treats things like white space, that could cause the server to not pull up uh, the right document and to instead show an error or a 400 error or 500 error. Um, so I'd say it'd be more technical in nature with the web application development and the particular web server you're using. I think by and large, the browsers won't care. They'll request anything uh, you're up for requesting. Um, and Googlebot is a browser, so it's going to behave like a Chrome. So you can kind of test it. How does Chrome handle it? That's how Googlebot's going to handle it. So you can run a test. Um, but by and large, I think what you'll find is the strictness and technical capability on the server and in the web development is where the issue will be. 
what do you think? I was, I'm sorry, Ted. I was just going to jump and say years ago, I worked for an e-commerce company. They had plus signs in their URL. Now, we never had problems with Google crawling or ranking us. But what we did run into problems regularly is if we wanted to post a link on, like, let's say, a Tumblr or I think even Twitter in the early days or something, it wouldn't always allow us to put the URL in because it wouldn't the, the, the interface wouldn't allow us to put plus signs in the URL. Yeah, um, validators might yeah. catch you. Yeah. So that we used to have that problem regularly. Um, so I started making the rule dashes only. I don't care if it works, dashes only going forward. <laughs> uh why does Google not give us the correct search volume? Uh yeah, we, we did a study uh a couple years ago uh using Benford's law on search volumes and found out that Google was cooking the books on these numbers. They're, they're obviously cook numbers. Like if you've seen a single keyword in Keyword Planner, you know they're cook numbers. Uh, so there's just no debate about it. Uh, the reason they're doing it is probably twofold. They're probably trying to keep the system performant by quantizing the data into easily storable and compressible amounts. So they're trying to give you... I guess, broader data in some regard by compressing it in other areas. Um, I tend to not think that's their main motivation, but engineering-wise, it could be. Uh, probably what they're trying to do is to corral people into like-minded bidding, which would drive up the bids and would be good for bottom line. I think that that's a more likely suspect, but technically, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Lee? I think that the, the biggest thing is because SEOs ruin everything. You know, the the if you follow Google's, you know, uh, general way of approaching stuff, they're like, you know, write good content for your user, blah blah blah. So in in their world, why would you concern yourself with keyword volume? It's not a it's not a factor because you're supposed to be writing content for users. Keyword volume shouldn't factor into it unless you're a damn SEO, in which case. You know, you're trying to game the system anyway. And we know from our other work that the quantized buckets, you know, they sit there and say, hey, this particular keyword gets, you know, between 1,000 and 10,000 searches a month. We know that some of those keywords get 200,000 searches a month, but some of them get 50 searches a month. And you can, you know, prove that, you know, the, so even the quantized ranges aren't necessarily accurate. So they are in, in many ways just obfuscating the data for their own reasons. And, you know, those those reasons for me tend to be to throw SEOs off the trail of certain things. You know, because if you knew that this keyword had, you know, instead of 2,000 searches a month, had 200,000 searches a month, there would be more SEOs chasing it. And maybe that, you know, it's just pain in the butt. They don't want that. In addition to the stuff you were talking about, about the, uh, you know, managing the bidding within the keywords, you know, but in the keyword space, as soon as you put an ad up, you're going to see the number of impressions that it gets. You're going to know what the true volume is. So it, it, it doesn't actually work for more than five minutes. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my two cents. And I could be wrong, but. All right. Uh, how do I control what Google shows in the meta description? All right. So the, the main problem is uh, all that CRO that the CROs went nuts doing, saying, I can walk you across the finish line. And, you know, it, you, you probably don't know unless you were at that conference. But there's a bunch of CROs that are uh, laughing and clapping back at SEOs, and they did a bunch of CRO to all these websites. Well, now Google's coming back and saying, hey, this CRO uh, meta description doesn't actually reflect what the page is about. So now you got a relevancy problem because you put in so much marketing collateral into it, it doesn't describe the page anymore. So you need to go back and make the meta description relevant to what this page is actually about. And you can see clues of what Google is reaching for in the text that they put in its place when they replace your meta description with the text uh, chosen from the page. They're trying to put relevant things in place instead of your meta description. So if you do that, 
uh, then you can regain control. And once you regain control, you can put small amounts of CRO back in. All right. So that's, that's how you do it. If you absolutely need to force the issue, uh, one of the clever ways is to use this system against itself. You end up having a blank uh, meta description tag, which I do not recommend. And then you go with numbered H2 headings and you put what you need to say in those numbered H2 headings. And Google is really fond of that list style and will often automatically pick those numbered headings as the presentation uh, in the search results summary. And so you can actually do a lot of CRO uh, if you exploit that. Um, so that that's that methodology. What do you think, Lee? I, I agree. I think th there's a couple of things that we've we've learned over time. One is that Google goes through phases where they will rewrite titles and meta descriptions a little or a lot. Uh, and you know, and and when they're in one of those phases where they're doing it and they're testing things for their own reasons we have less control over what they display, you know, regardless of, of what we do. So that's just the reality of, uh, of, of that. And I think that what you're saying, you know, what you said there was, was also very true. There's things that you can do to, to uh, kind of encourage them to show what it is that you want to show. But again, it's their system. We're at their mercy and just understand that they're, they're testing things, and when they test things, they're not necessarily testing things that are optimal for your page. They're testing things to see what's optimal for the users of their system. So they will sometimes pick a title or a meta description that is bad and then penalize your page for it. They will push you down in the, the SERPs, you know, when you see that. And, you know, Ted's volatility tool has shown that just uh, tons and tons of time. So don't assume that just because they're picking something that it's better. Yep. And uh, oftentimes the things that get you into trouble with Google split testing of both titles and uh, summary text, it's dynamic text in those zones. It's publish dates, it's product counts, it's, you know, things of that nature. So when uh, a product goes out of stock in that category page, and the product count changes, then Google's like, oh, it changed. Now I need to split test with a bunch of different things. If you take that dynamic text out of those zones, you don't get that instability. So that would be the other common problem is dynamic text and title and meta description. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. If I forget to have certain pages on my website, does this affect the website's ability to get indexed? Uh, for example, about us and privacy policy. I find uh, that it's on a spectrum. There's a smooth gradient of it does nothing to uh, it. It hurts you or it helps you. Uh, so you will find examples to the contrary, but I find it's often beneficial to have a privacy policy about us, contact us, terms of service, links on a page. Now, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I don't want to do all that. You know, it's boring and dumb and nobody likes it. Uh, if you look at, at a lot of my smaller projects, those are all blank pages. <laughs> It's like having the links seems to be the factor. It is a very subtle factor. Um, and these kinds of subtle factors make me think that this is an emergent factor. So there are factors that Google engineers code into the code and they specifically code them. And then there are emergent factors that kind of evolve out of the system organically on their own. And so I suspect this is probably an emergent factor where Google is looking at training sets of highly trustworthy sites and web spam. And they're trying to build a classifier that says how spammy is any given page based on characteristics we observe. 
and web spam probably doesn't put in all of those uh, uh, procedural pages. And so when you put in those links, you probably get a little bit less web spamminess, which gives you a little bit of extra ranking boost. And in cases where a little bit matters, you can see it. Um, and so that's that's kind of my take on it, is it's a little bit of a boost. What do you think, Lee? I think that, that you're right about that. I think it was uh, Carolyn uh, and I were looking at some stuff this is, I don't know, two, three years ago, we were looking at um, some of our test sites that were having trouble indexing. And they were just, they didn't have all of those other, other pages, but we noticed in the crawl logs that Google was looking for a privacy policy. And we said, could it be that this is one of, you know, a requirement or something or a checkbox or something? So we started putting, you know, a privacy policy on our damn test sites and we got better indexation uh, at that particular time. So there may be something to it now, as as we know subsequently, um, Ted's privacy policies on a number of his sites are just blank pages. <laughs> so it's not that they're reading it, you know, but they are checking for it. You know, they're they're coming and crawling looking for it. Um, Carolyn, do you have anything you want to add on that? Um, yeah, just a little bit. Um, one of the things I've started looking at are in the crawl logs, like are people coming specifically and only to like contact us or uh, privacy or uh, about forms, uh, you know, about pages. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not Google per se, but they're coming from known IPs that may possibly be like um, the Google uh, Raiders, mm -hmm. not, not Raiders, but Raiders. Um, and uh, I have seen an uptick in that kind of behavior and um, updated the uh, log tool so that I can create like a separate sheet of that. So I can kind of keep an eye on it. Like they, they seem to come in, in uh, batches. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I was, I, I found out like all my test sites that I did not have a uh, about page on. So I started adding about pages. Right. Now are you seeing that in the log that there is a, a just a request coming through for, you know, mysite.com slash about? No, they're coming directly to uh, the contact page. Not, not uh, referring from somewhere else, but coming directly to it. Right. So okay. they got it from somewhere. And... Uh, and again, this is not like every single time the contact page got pulled up, but or about page, but you know, from a specific group of uh, IPs that I'm guessing came from, um, uh, you know, like where where they're actually checking, but it's not Google. They're not Google IPs. Right. They're not Google bot IPs. They're not Google IPs. So, um, and and it's easy, like if. I found myself, I found myself in those logs when I fixed my contact pages. <laughs> so, yeah. And, it, and I think at times on a small enough website, you can, you can sort the Google bot uh, crawl order by timestamp, but on, on larger sites, like what Charles deals with, it's a much harder proposition because my understanding is Google doesn't use uh, the referring URL uh, uh, header. So they won't tell you the refer. Um, and so it's hard to piece together the crawl path on a massive website. Um, so the the notion of, of Google direct to it, was it direct or was it just buried in a queue and now it's it, at this time it was the turn of that URL, but it was part of a crawl that got queued with time delay in between the steps. It It's a hard designation to think about because you have to think about the databases and queues and how Googlebot would do things on massive scales. Um. So yeah, yeah, I, I wonder about just that little tiny detail. Did Google start there or was it a queued URL that just took time to get to? Yeah, I sometimes I, like I'll see the pull of the site map, the robots text and, you know, all that and then nothing coming after that. 
but Im immediately after that, right? And then there'll be a delay. So I'm sure that's exactly, yeah. you know, but, it's hard to draw that line. But again, if, if your site is small enough, then I think there's decent odds that timestamp will, will sort the crawl behavior. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, when I look at the sites at the top, they do not have the highest keyword density and not the most referring domains. So what reason, so what could be the reason for them to rank at the top? Well, you have to remember that there's many, many, many ways to rank a page. All right. So anybody that assumes there's only one way to do it, those people are wrong. Um, so you, we've seen it where somebody could rank to the top with 36 linear feet of vertical scrolling. We actually looked at one of those websites a few years back on the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, the skyscraper is with keywords throughout is a tried and true method for ranking a page. So that's one way to do it. Uh, my experience has taught me that I can beat that skyscraper with a much smaller page at a much higher keyword density. And so that becomes uh, what I typically would do in those cases because I don't want to create tens of thousands of words of content and then tune it and so forth. I think that's really weird. Um, so I've I've learned alternatives to that technique to rank in a different way and then somebody else might come in and see my article and make a loosely relevant page but massively over invest in backlinks because that's another way they can rank a page mm -hmm. and terry samuels and clint butler have both ranked pages with nothing but schema because that's apparently another way you can rank a page and then people like Lee come in and they're like, oh, if you get these entities dialed in, then that's another way you can rank a page. Mm -hmm. And so my guess is you're thinking about one or two ways to rank a page and thinking that's the whole universe. But there right. are these other 18 ways of ranking a page uh, that you're neglecting. And one of those probably has the information you're missing. What do you think, Lee? Yeah, I think you're you're exactly right. If we, you know, there's always the number thrown around. There's 200 ranking factors. So let's just assume there there are 200 ranking factors, and you can get a certain number of points from each one, and you add up all those points. There's an infinite number of ways to get a score that'll rank a page. You know, not just it's not just simple as you know on page and off page. You can have images. You can have internal links. You can have schema. You can have you know whatever all those 200 factors are. So what you're seeing is the stuff that you, you're right. You're seeing the stuff that you're looking at and you're saying they don't have a good amount of these. Well, they have something because they're ranking at the top. You just, you're not identifying it. So I would suggest that you, you know, take a look at a core report and find out what they do have in abundance, uh, what tends to correlate and, you know, start your analysis there. Um, let's see. Can I beat them if I increase keyword density? M maybe not. You know, uh, maybe not. Uh, it, it it can work. It can be uh, an important factor. Uh, but if you're neglecting other critical things like factor diversity or entities, uh, you know, adding more keyword density won't solve those things. And so also, if you have... Well, keep going, Go ahead. Ted. Oh, yeah. So if you have critical deficits, you really need to figure out what you've been neglecting and fix it instead of just repeating the same two tricks over and over. I was going to say, Carolyn and I, we ran a test. This was several years back. Um, and we were, we were taking up a challenge of trying to rank a page with nothing but on page, zero backlinks whatsoever. And we, we tried for weeks. We kept tweaking and retweaking and everything else. And the best we could ever get this one page or this keyword to do was to get to about position 12. And that was it. And then one day we just said, to hell with it. And we built one backlink to it. And when that backlink got crawled and processed, it shot up to number one. 
So, you know, the, the, the simple fact was we were held back by the fact that we were missing something that Google felt was important in the algorithm. And so you can have, uh, like you can take keyword density up. We know we've tested it up to 95%, but that's in a, a space where it's an artificial space where you're only working you know, with keyword density. The fact is, if you actually took a real page up to 95% keyword density, you're removing you know, variations, you're removing entities, you're removing a whole lot of other stuff that also gives you ranking factors and you're, you're pushing yourself you know, away from your, your target goal. So I would think that, you know, Yes, you probably can do better by increasing your keyword density to reasonable levels. I think, you know, we find, you know, 12, 15% is about as high as a normal page one in a competitive space would go. Um, going beyond that generally has uh, diminishing, rapidly diminishing returns. But if you don't have backlinks or you don't have some of the other necessary things or maybe you don't have a privacy policy and that's the reason why your stuff maybe you've got a technical issue it has nothing to do with the on page or the off page whatsoever we've seen that as well so you have to make sure that all of these things are are evaluated which is why the classic it depends is really true so without the specifics of your site and without uh some data and some reports you know we can't tell you if you could or couldn't uh, rank it by increasing keyword density or any other uh, SEO tactic. If I wanted to get into SEO testing, where do I start? Uh, you know, what I would recommend today is uh, keep it simple, but actually start testing. And one of the first things I would do is on any page I edit, I would put a hidden test keyword in a hidden span tag at the bottom, you know, down in the, the bottom of the article. If I update a page, I put in a, a you know, a JL3, R6, RQQ, ZZYXXLLMNT in a hidden span. So no people see it. It's just a hidden span, the hidden word at the bottom. And then I would start noticing, like, how long does it take Google to process this page? At what point is that hidden keyword observable in search? And I'd learn patterns, and I'd find problem pages, and how does the hidden keyword behave on my problem pages? And uh, what if I put the hidden keyword in, in unusual places? What if I put it in a data attribute or in a title attribute or in a class attribute? Is it findable in those different zones of a page? And these are very simple tests. They either work or they don't, and you don't need complicated testing. So I, I would start there and see what you can learn. And it's probably going to be a lot. What do you think, Lee? I agree. The only uh, thing that I'll add to that is I see people, uh, let's suppose that we had the the theory that Google loves images. So the more images on the page, the better you'll rank. And so what somebody will do is they'll say, let me take one of the pages on my site. Let me go add some more images. And then whatever happens, they're going to try to draw a conclusion from that when it's you've just modified one page. And just by modifying the page, you've changed the update date on it. It might have nothing to do with the images, whether it moves up, down, sideways, you, you don't know. So I encourage people, take the, take the time to do it multiple times. I always try to do tests 10 times. So if you want to test something like, you know, more images, go add, you know, three or four images to 10 pages on your site. And then look at them as a cluster of pages to see, did they move up, down, or, or yeah, some moved up and some moved down? What happened on average? And start to use that data as, as a more robust um, conclusion than just doing something once. I hate to see people do something once and then go, hmm, I'm not really sure. You can be more certain if you just implement it you know, multiple times. All right. Is it better for your meta description to be unique from your content or is it okay if it appears somewhere in your content? I think what you really want is your meta description to, uh, to basically relevantly describe what the page is. What, what's it about? What's being offered here? Cause if you can do that with relevancy, 
uh, it seems to help with your your ranking and targeting. And if you if you can't be relevant while describing what the page is, then Google tends to not want to use it at all. So if you want a meta description that's being used, you got to think about, well, what is this document? Um, what do you think, Lee? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, you want a relevant meta description because, you know, Google's trying to show they're highlighting terms in the meta description that shows how relevant your page is for the search that's up there. So you know, if you're trying to rank for Seattle Plumber and your meta description is talking about um, how you've been a family business for, you know, 27 years and, you know, three generations of Smith's, you know, work at the, you know, that that's the Google's going to replace that because it, it's not relevant. So Charles, you probably see this a lot. You have any thoughts on it? All, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It, the problem I always find it's kind of the reverse of supplemental content SEO. It's supplemental content that has nothing to do with the article that's on the page. Um, ads, um, uh, links to other articles within our within our within our pages. Um, we'll have um, we'll have things that people want to put on the page because there's certain things we want to promote as a company, so they'll want to put that stuff on the page, and it, it acts like supplemental content. But the problem is it's not optimized supplemental content. It's just the reverse. So it waters down the optimization of all of our pages. So there's always a, a battle that goes on with what are we putting on the page versus what do we need to put on the page versus what do we want to put on the page? Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Um, all right. Uh, used a press release for the first time from an SEO perspective using matches service used exact match anchor it's been six weeks no serp impact and h hrefs has only picked up five of the links um i i would say the normal outcome of a press release ranges from no impact to some positive impact and uh, the details and what you needed to do and how much you did and how you did it uh, are important. They're material as to whether you get no impact or, or some impact. Um, you will likely not see those backlink numbers and third-party tools like Ahrefs for many months. Uh, those types of data sets they they don't update on the time frame that you think they do and they don't cover everything on the internet they're teeny tiny samples of what's on the internet so if you saw any in six weeks i'd say that's remarkable um so normally uh you know in past press releases i've done i've seen no change in ahref numbers for many months and so I think that's more typical. Um, if you were going to see ranking improvement, you probably would have seen it around week four. So my guess is either what you did was not enough to be competitive or uh, uh, it wasn't tuned properly. So the press release should be about the topic you're trying to rank for. The anchor text should be related you know, one of the keywords, uh, the variations, brand, no brand, something to that nature. Um, and then, uh, you know, the question becomes, uh, what were you up against? So did it come from a Quora report? You know, how many referring domains were you short? Because if you were short 1,200 referring domains and you did one press release that gets you 500, you still might be short 700, and that could be a reason why you saw no movement. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, you know, we also know that not all links are equal. So depending upon, you know, who your competitors are and what they've got, uh, that could be material as well, because if they have a homepage link from the New York Times, most of us can get those. 
And so that would be a very difficult link to overcome. You'd have to overcompensate based on what the numbers say because they have an extremely high quality asset. Uh, now, usually that isn't the case. So that's not a common thing, especially for uh, lower uh, competition keywords. So uh, normally I, I wonder, was the targeting off or was the amount of referring domains off? Those are usually the big culprits. Uh, Lee, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I share a, a story with people that years ago there was a cartoon that I saw and it's a mailman was coming to the front door of this house and he had a package in his hands and the, the front door is open and a guy standing there, he's a bodybuilder and he's got huge shoulders and, you know, huge arms and, you know, he's chiseled, got the abs, but his legs are pencils. And, you know, the caption under it was, thank God the leg course arrived. And SEO a lot of times is like that where we have certain things that we like to do, but this guy would not win other competitions by doing more bench presses, you know, by doing more curls, those things are going to build things that he already has. The problem is that he skipped leg day. And a lot of times, you know, we assume that certain things are, right, well, if I do a press release, it's this, or if I, if I optimize my page this way, it'll, it'll fix the, the problem. And sometimes we're solving the wrong damn problem. What I see a lot of times is that people will use press release or links to try to solve something where they haven't been successful moving it any other way. And sometimes that's necessary to have some links, but oftentimes there's a fundamental problem with the page. Either it's not well optimized. So even if the press release was done well and optimized, you have a crap target page that it's going to, or sometimes you have a little technical issue on your site that's preventing the page from being uh, crawled or evaluated properly. And no amount of press releases or on page is going to fix that. So you have to make sure that you're solving the right problem. And that takes, you know, analysis and, and some skill there. But I would look, if you're not getting any results, not any movement from a press release, I'd go back and check your on page. And then I would also check for technical issues because we find, you know, most sites that we look at have, you know, some to many, you know, technical issues that can, you know, inhibit um, crawl and indexation of a page. You know, even some of our own sites we found uh, not too long ago, I found one where the uh, XML sitemap plugin that we we're using broke. And thus our sitemap was throwing 404 errors. That affected a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not the backlinks that's the problem. Yeah. And business growth ready comments at the bottom, if you haven't seen it to, uh, add YouTube, uh, links or use a, uh, indexer on your press release distribution, kind of nudge Google to find all those and evaluate them. And, uh, that's, that's some pretty good advice. Um, uh, some people even do link building to their press, but I wouldn't aggressively do that. That's a good way to get kicked out of the syndication in places but you know the indexing of it i i think is a clever uh suggestion there um and he also mentions that having it be topical is important um let's see i've heard uh we're gonna go into a speed round so we can wrap this up i've heard a, a few references now about supplemental content for on page uh optimization uh would you elaborate on that yeah a lot of seos make a bad assumption that the only way to rank a page is by taking all of the keyword density and word count and factors and cramming it into the main content uh that's not true i'm here to tell you i had a 20 year uh uh, career in online retail where I largely ranked pages from the footer. Okay, you can actually leave the main content completely alone and SEO the page and make it rank. So supplemental content, read the quality raters guidelines. It's white hat. You want it to be uh, relevant and on topic, uh, but you can rank the whole page from accordions at the bottom or in a sidebar. 
totally doable. And not only that, when you put SEO and CRO in their own swim lane, uh, SEO gets remarkably easy because when you're trying to put hundreds of words and variations and exact matches and entities into your main article, it is weird. It's weird and it's hard. So don't do it. You don't have to. It's optional. What do you think, Lee? I think uh, I would just add that it's an upcoming, it's a feature in the upcoming release of Quora as well. So just throwing yeah. a little plug there. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Google already uh, scrapes and harvests your data. Yes. Um, cannibalization question. Homepage outranks target targeted page i reduce keyword density to the lowest and put a link from the home page to the targeted page with an anchor but still no luck uh yeah so you're you're detuning the ranking one and sometimes that's not the best option sometimes you need to optimize the not ranking one and so uh, to take this down a level, like an e-com, what we'll often see is you'll have a home page sometimes cannibalizes everything. Sometimes it'll be a top level category cannibalizing the subcategories. So your, uh, your amethyst jewelry displays a lot of amethyst bracelets subcategory so your amethyst jewelry is ranking for your amethyst bracelet keywords and in those cases often what we find is doing the seo on the amethyst bracelet website is the thing that needed to happen first you might still need to de-optimize the the ranking one but that that should come second tuning the page that should be winning should be step one, because if it's not tuned enough, no amount of detuning will move it in. So you need to make sure that that target is actually set first. What do you think, Lee? I'll add uh, two tips. Uh, one is make sure that internal anchor text from content pointing to the page that you want has the, you know, the anchor text, you know, the, the keyword that you want that page to rank for and make sure that none, uh, you don't have anchor text going to like your homepage with the, you know, the keyword that you want, like a service page, for example, to rank for an internal page to rank for. So it sends a clear signal to Google on this website. We would like this page to rank for, you know, for this term, this topic. The second thing that I'll tell you is if it's in local, there are times when Google has a, an, preference for homepage over an internal page. You can have a homepage that has almost no content whatsoever <clears throat> and an internal page that is optimized to the nines. And Google will show the homepage when you search for the, the service. And at the, those particular times, there's not a lot you can do, but you can look around and see that there are a lot of other sites that are probably in the same boat that you are. So, and then when that happens, you're just kind of stuck for a little while. Have you done any AI content tests? I haven't done any formal testing on AI content, but I have experimented the heck out of AI content. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you anecdotally, I have had a nearly 100% success rate using AI content to help boost pages. And so the, the cases where it didn't work are the exception that are hard to find. Um, but I can also tell you there are two methodologies that seem to work and not everybody is using those two methodologies. So one is stitching where you use prompts to make small parts of the document and you stitch the outputs together to make a well-crafted, well-rounded document. So stitching is one way uh, we've had success. And then lists of things as supplemental content is the other way we've had success with it. So I would focus on those two areas and maybe you can see some of what I've been seeing. Uh, Lee, how about you? I'll say this. Um, one, I have entire websites that are nothing but chat GPT content that rank. Now, they don't rank extraordinarily well because large language models, chat, GPD, and other ones are trained on a corpus of documents, not a corpus of well SEO'd documents. So, you know, your mileage may vary by uh, by niche. But yeah, I mean, there's no, 
Um, you know, some of the work that, that Honey's done over uh, the past year or so looking at AI detection, I, I see nothing, you know, that prevents AI content uh, from ranking. Yeah. And, and I as well, 100% of the time had to do some tuning on the AI output. And yeah. uh, the, the largest failing in it is, is usually too short on the variations and exact matches. So you tend to have to go back in and work on your keywords. Right. Um, the thing it does well is entities and LSI. So that's yeah. kind of the thing you largely get for free out of it. Um, all right. Uh, have, I'm struggling, struggling heavily using Cora. It seems like no matter how often I meet the recommendation changes, I do not get any movement from my websites. Uh, schedule a meeting with me. Let's take a look at what's going on. So it's hard to uh, answer that in a vacuum of the data and the, the circumstances. So let's uh, let's get a yeah. meeting and schedule it. It's on my contact page. Yeah, honey's over here. She's saying it could be a technical issue. So, you know, Cora won't solve a technical issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's let's take a look at it. All right, that's a show. I want to thank everyone. And next week we will look at the SEM Rush uh, study. Uh, two-part series so part one we're going to look at the methodology and the gripes about the methodology and and the you know how they're using statistics and and that stuff and we'll answer questions about that type of thing and then in part two we'll actually look at the factors and and have opinions about the factors and stuff so uh we're going to break it up so it's not a three-hour episode, so we'll do that next week. Thanks, everyone.